and then we should, okay, the recording has started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this class on our identity in Christ. Thank you for connecting to the class this morning. We're going to pray, then we're going to get started. And I'm sure the others will um, join us in the meantime. Okay, uh, let's just take a moment to pray and uh, we'll start. Um, who would like to pray? Could just pray for us together. Can I pray, Pastor? Okay, Rebecca, go ahead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Master. Oh, thank you, Lord. We come again upon you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Last night you save us and protect us from all enemy, Lord. Yes, Father. And give us a new day for your children, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, we glorify you, Lord. We lift your name high, Lord. Yes, Father. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I pray that fill with your spirit in our in our heart lord give your prayer presence in these sessions lord through pastor we understood your scriptures for depth of our heart lord yes lord and open each spirituality's eyes and open each spirituality's ears lord that can we stand in your name lord oh lord make us according like you lord jesus Yes, Father, change our life, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, we want your presence in these sessions, Lord Jesus. Oh, Father, you are great in your mercy, Lord. You are great in your oh, peace, Lord Jesus. Yes, Father. Oh Lord, oh Lord, I pray for the pastor, Lord, through pastor, whatever we, eh, Lord, eh, we are understanding, Lord Jesus, yes, yes, Lord, oh, thank you, Father, thank you, Master, Lord, oh, Lord, according, oh, Lord, in your scriptures, Daniel's uh, 12 is written, Lord, those who teach your words, other they will sign like star, Lord, and those who make a uh, turn many to righteousness, Lord, like the stars forever and ever, Lord. Oh, Lord, like that we make our teachers and your students, Lord Jesus. Yes, Father, thank you for this new day, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, we want your presence from beginning to ending, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, give your wisdom and fill your wisdom, Lord, and guide us and lead us, Lord Jesus, because you are the good guiders and the good leader, Lord. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone, once again. Thank you for connecting. Good to see all of you. Uh, it's a new, new week and a new month. And uh, it's amazing how 2021 has gone. We last down to the last three months of this year. Uh, so much has happened in 2021. And uh, yeah, and uh, looking forward to these three months as we uh, we have two more months of classes, October, November, and then uh, we break for December and then we pick up again in January. Uh, I trust uh, all of you uh, who have joined us and uh, hope that August and September has the two months of college has been uh, enriching, meaningful, uh, something that's uh, blessed your life spiritually and your walk with God. So, uh, yeah, thank you for being part of this uh, online college. I know it's not the same as uh, sitting in face-to-face -face and interacting, uh, but uh, at least it's something that we can uh, use this platform connect from different places and uh, study the word of God together. And uh, yeah, we're just grateful that we're able to do this. All right, we've been in this uh, wonderful journey uh, in the word of God, looking at the revelation of our identity in Christ. And um, uh, it, this is such an amazing truth uh, in the scriptures like we said at the very beginning, the Lord Jesus said that this revelation will come. You know, we read in John 14, verses 19 and 20, he said, in that day you will know 
that you are in me and I am in you. So he spoke ahead of time. He said, look, that revelation is coming. And sure enough, it's amazing how uh, God uh, touched the life of a man named Saul, who was actually a persecutor. He was uh, against the church, against Christ himself. And God just touched him, turned his life all around. And through him, primarily, and of course through other apostles as well, uh, we have the written scriptures, the epistles, in which we see the unfolding of this amazing revelation that we are in Christ, Christ in his, uh, is in us, and what that means, how it changes our lives, each of us, uh, because we are in Christ. And so this course has uh, attempted to... Uh, to put this 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 revelation in a in a kind of a systematic way, so that we can look at it piece by piece and uh, digest it, take it in, and uh, let it let the word of God transform us, and so that we can be conformed to what God wants us to be. And uh, the main important the important thing for all of us is to understand this is my identity in Christ. This is my inheritance in Christ. And then, so therefore, this is how I'm going to live my life from that truth. Now, uh, we have to admit that uh, a lot of the church, uh, uh, God's people, um, they're good people, they're well-meaning people, they, they love Jesus, but when we don't understand, when we don't receive this revelation, then it's very difficult to, to live out of that. You know, so it's almost like among believers, we, we, we seem to have those who are trying to, who have understood and are trying to live out of that revelation, who we are in Christ. And then there are those who walk as mere men they walk they're saved but they're still living just you know confined to the natural um uh, and so sometimes it's very difficult to as those of us who are trying to live out about this truth of identification who we are in christ and say this is who we are in christ so let's try to live that way let's live like jesus uh, and then there are others you know they are they love jesus they're born again but because they have not received that spiritual understanding, they end up living as just mere people, normal, natural people. And so then there's this, it's almost like a, two different kinds of people trying to you know, be part of the body. Uh, it, it is difficult, but then we just have to continue and then we share the truth with people, help them understand, look, this is what the Bible says. But, um, like the Apostle Paul said, the eyes of our understanding must be enlightened so that we may know, we may know him, that we may know the hope of his calling and that we may know the riches of his inheritance that he's given to us, right? So we need the eyes of our understanding, our spiritual understanding to be enlightened so that we can receive this revelation and then begin to live out of that. So in as much as, you know, we have learned this and we will continue learning um, um, pass it on try to share it with others um, teach it to others that they may also know uh, the truth of our identity in Christ and our uh, inheritance in Christ and encourage others to live out of this this truth of what God has done for us in Christ today uh, we're going to go to the next chapter, which where we're going to focus on the fact that we are children of God. And because we are children, the Bible says we now become heirs of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Uh, and so we want to understand, what does that mean? If you are an heir of God and you are a joint heir with Christ 
uh, you know, uh, what does it mean and how do I live out, the, out of that? Because it's very powerful. This is spiritual truth. It is not fantasy. It is not just some imagination. This is truth. God says you are his son. You are his daughter. That means you are somebody. And he says, because you're my son, you're my daughter. I've made you my heir. And I made you a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now that's amazing. And so we want to kind of delve into that, find out what that means, and uh, how do we live out of that uh, practically, right? Uh, so we've um, put out the PDF on the coursework. You can uh, you can take it from there. I'm just going to share it for us, and we will get started. So we're going to talk about the fact that we are children of God. And consequently, you know, what, what happens because of that. Now, the truth that we are the children of God is something we have all embraced. We all know it's not uh, new to us. Um, so we just, you know, uh, quickly read a few passages. Uh, Galatians 3, 26 and John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Could somebody read both of these passages for us, please? Uh, these are familiar verses. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Hmm. Amen. Amen. So we see this truth brought out for us in uh, many places, but the Bible repeatedly tells us we are children of God. We are sons and daughters of God. And it has happened through faith, right? So uh, everywhere it says, you know, through faith, through those who believe, uh, to those who have received him, right? So we become children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, by receiving him. And uh, we also see that God planned this uh, for us uh, way ahead of time. In Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5. Uh, could somebody read that for us, please? Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Mm. Amen. Thank you. So he chose us in him. He chose us in Christ. And this he did before the foundation of the world. We saw this earlier. He did it before the foundation of the world. And he predestined us to adoption. He predestined us to adoption by Jesus Christ as, as his sons and daughters. Right, through Jesus Christ. So God had thought of this ahead of time. He had planned this ahead of time. He chose us in him. We're going to look at that a little bit um, uh, later. He chose us in him. Right. So uh, these scriptures you know, uh, are teaching us that uh, God had uh, actually planned to have a family and way ahead of time, even before the foundation of the world. This was in his heart. To have people who will belong to him as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Right? And so uh, this was something he predestined. We will talk about these, these words, chosen predestination. We'll talk about those words. So he he pre-planned these things and this was according to the good pleasure of his will that means this was what he was pleased to do this was something he was really excited about he was really pleased to do this 
right? And uh, we will come to these uh, additional scriptures here that um, uh, that I've listed here. Uh, let me let me see here. Okay, so uh, there are several scriptures which we are going to read as we go along, but let's kind of start breaking it down, right? So first of all, we read here in Ephesians 5, he predestined us to adoption, right? So we want to just kind of dwell on that word, we are adopted as sons and daughters, right? So we are children of God, but the Bible also says we are adopted as sons and daughters. We are, he predestined us to adoption. So once again, we see this whole idea, or I shouldn't say idea, but this truth of adoption mentioned to us in several places. We read it in Ephesians 1.5. He predestined us to adoption. We will read it in two more passages. Uh, could somebody read Romans 8, 14 through 17, please? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. And uh, also Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, it kind of repeats the same truth. Could we read it, please? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Hmm. Amen. So when we look at these passages, they're, they're pretty much parallel. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7, Romans 8, 14 to 7, they kind of say the same thing or similar things. But let's emphasize, let's kind of you know look into it piece by piece. The first thing is we find this word adoption repeated right? in Ephesians 1.5 or in Romans 8, uh, 14 through 17, as well as here he, he, he says we have received adoption, the adoption. Right? So the idea or this truth of what adoption is, God has brought us from being orphaned or abandoned or fatherless into his own family where he becomes our heavenly father. And also in adoption, we are brought into something that we did not have before at all. So now the, uh, earlier, in, uh, in John 1, verse 12, we, we saw that we were born of him, born of God. So, in, so uh, the Bible uses both, uh, both terms, one of being born of God, one of being adopted by God, right? It uses both terms. So you say, well, how can you be born of God as at the same time be adopted of God? Well, God is just using our language to communicate certain truths to us, all right? So uh, we, don't, we shouldn't get too worried about the language itself, but understand the meaning of what God is trying to tell us. So on the one hand, he says, you have been born into my family. That means we have his life and nature in us. We are, we are born of him. But at that time, he says, I have adopted you. That means he's saying, look, I have become your father. And I have brought you into something you never had before. So from that sense, we understand adoption as well, that God has been so gracious to us that he's brought us into something we would never have had access to if he had not done it. That's the whole point of adoption. Somebody 
extends their goodness to us. And we are brought into it. That's what God did. He adopted us as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. And therefore, that's the first thing. The second thing we see in these scripture texts is that he's given us the spirit of adoption. So the Holy Spirit has many titles. God, the Holy Spirit, has many titles. And one of his titles is he's the spirit of adoption or some versions would say the spirit of sonship. Right? That means he's the one who's brought us in to the family of God. He is a spirit of adoption. And because of his presence in our hearts, we become sons and daughters of God. And he is the one who gives us the ability to call God Abba, Father. And he is the one who gives us the conviction that we are children of God. So the spirit bears witness. The spirit is testifying. He's giving us that conviction. He's giving us that word, the testimony in our spirit. We are sons and God, daughters of God. So if somebody says, you know, how do you know you're a son and daughter of God? Well, there's a conviction in my heart. Uh, but that conviction comes from the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of sonship. So we are children of God. That is, we are born of him and into his family. We're also adopted as sons and daughters of God. We are brought into something uh, that we never had. The other thing I want to point out from these verses is that this adoption does away with something. In both Romans 8 and Galatians 4, we see this thing about the spirit of bondage to fear, the spirit of slavery. Here again in Galatians 4, he says, you're no longer a slave. You are no longer a slave. So what we are seeing is, God is saying, look, I've adopted you into my family. I've given you the Holy Spirit as the spirit of adoption. He gives you the ability to cry out, Abba, Father, to call God your father. He is the one who's given you the conviction that you are a son and daughter of God. Therefore, do not see yourself as a slave. Do not behave like a slave do not think of yourself like a slave meaning uh, the idea is think of yourself as a son and a daughter of god not as somebody who does not belong not as somebody who is uh, you know who is, think think about a you know a servant who's you know in contrast a servant and a, and a, and a son and daughter a son and daughter has that sense of belonging a servant doesn't have that sense of belonging. A son and daughter, you know, feels welcomed before the father. Servant, not like that. You know, so God says, I want you to therefore behave or live like a son or daughter, not like a servant, a slave. So God himself, and we're seeing it in both these passages, Romans 8, and uh, Galatians 4, he says, I want you to change your, your whole dynamic in how you relate to God. You relate to God as a son and daughter because you are son and daughter and don't behave like a fearful servant. You know, so you have not received the spirit of slave, bondage or slavery to go into fear. We are not, we are not here to be in that morbid fear of God, but we are here to behave like sons and daughters of God. And God is our Father, and we call Him Abba, Father, and uh, we have that 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 beautiful relationship as a son and daughter with Almighty God. So that's what he wants for us. And he's done this for us in Christ, through Christ. That means he's saying, look, this was my plan. And now that you are in Christ, you are my son, you're my daughter. And I want you to behave like that. Behave like that. 
right? So being adopted into God's family now gives us this wonderful sense of belonging. You know, I, uh, uh, I belong, you belong to the family of God. You belong to God and God is your Abba Father. And uh, you can relate to him, not as a fearful slave, but as a, you know, loved son and daughter of God. And in connection, you know, to being a child of God, being an adopted son and daughter of God, there are all these other things that we are going to examine. The next truth we see here, uh, okay, let me pause at this moment just to make sure everybody is with me. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, I see that uh, Divya has a question based on last week's session on freedom in Christ. Oh, we were supposed to answer some questions. Okay, yes, thanks for reminding uh, Divya. I, I just remember now, last week, towards the end of the session, we kind of rushed through a few questions. I, okay, I, and I didn't... Uh, uh, it have time to respond to some of these questions. I, I forgot. Yeah, let's take it up. Let's finish up those questions before we go forward. Go ahead, Divya. Thank you, Pastor. It's regarding the feast uh, and the freedom from those um, rituals and feasts that Jews used to do. So I just mm. post that question. Okay. Can we embrace the spirit behind the feast as some of them are given for remembrance of God's goodness and faithfulness towards the Israelites? Also, why is that even God is very specific about the appointed times in the New Testament? For example, Jesus Christ died during the Passover feast. The Holy Spirit came upon believers on the day of Pentecost. Okay. All right. So let's answer the second part of your question first, and then we'll look at the first part. So all that God gave his people in the Old Testament were a type and a shadow of the reality, right? So many things that we see. So even these feasts, the Feast of Passover, the first fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, um, these were a shadow, uh, a figure of, of the reality which is Jesus Christ. So when Christ came, he not only resembled that shadow, that means Christ, for example, said, 1 Corinthians 5.5 5 says, Christ is our Passover lamb sacrificed for us. So he came in some way resembling what the people understood. But of course, he was much more than that. He was the reality of it all. And that's why you find that God very intentionally did certain things. That Jesus, as the Passover lamb, was killed at the same time. He died on the cross at the same time as the sacrificial lamb would be killed. He rose up on the day of the first fruits three days after the Passover, intentionally, right? God planned it. He, of course, God could have raised him up within 30, less than 30 minutes. That's not, a, that's not a big deal for God. But he intentionally waited for the day of the first fruits. And he rose up there. So he was, he was saying, this is the real, you know, first fruits. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the first fruits. That's why it's called Pentecost. Again, God timed it. Now, God could have poured out the Holy Spirit any, you know, any time before or after, but He chose to do it that way because saying this is the act, this is the reality. Everything else, all those feasts, are only pointing to the reality. They are only uh, shadows of the reality. So, God intentionally did that. Right? So there's there's a lot of purpose and intentionality behind. Those, those, those works of God. Right? So that's why God was very specific. You know, at the same time, it's amazing. 
that Christ was sacrificed, he was resurrected, and the Holy Spirit was poured out, the church was born. Now, the, the fir first part of the question is, can we embrace the spirit behind the feast? Yes, in the sense that, you know, uh, we still need to study about the Passover. Why? Because that, is t that gives us understanding about the real Passover, which is Jesus Christ. So we go to Exodus 12, we read about it and say, this is what happened on the first night of the Passover. Uh, and that throws a lot of meaning when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 that Christ is our Passover, right? Uh, and so in that sense, yes, we embrace, you know, the, the spirit and the meaning of what is being said. But that does not mean that today we need to keep the, the feast of the Passover or we, that we do what they, the Jews did, you know, in preparation for the fast of Passover. They had the, you know, seven days of unleavened bread and then they you know, they cleaned house and they took everything out and then they had the, they killed the Passover lamb. And now, you know, if you want to go through it just for the sake of an experience or learning something, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. But to keep it as a ritual or to keep it as a feast, uh, thinking that it's going to give us something, some spiritual benefit, or maybe it will help us understand a little bit more about Christ or Passover, maybe from that point of view, you could, you know, engage, you know, do it once or something just for the experience. But we don't do it because it's going to make us any different spiritually, in the sense it's going to make me any closer to God or something like that, right? So that's why we have to be careful. And the reason I say that is because, you know, in as much as we are as zealous about the Jewish people, that they are God's chosen, the Bible tells us to pray for Israel and all of that, we shouldn't get pulled in to becoming Jews. Right? And that's in some in some in the church, there is the segment of Christians or who, who are so passionate about Jews, they begin to embrace all everything about Judaism as though that's going to make us real Christians. The Bible is moving the other way. You know, the New Testament is moving the other way. It's moving out of Judaism into freedom in Christ. And sadly, today a lot of Christians are moving into Judaism, thinking that's going to give us greater closeness to Jesus Christ. And that's not true. Yeah, they're moving, the, they're actually moving opposite to the move of the Holy Spirit. You know, they start practicing, wanting to keep a lot of the Jewish traditions, blow the shofar and, you know, uh, light the menorah and all. I mean, it, what is what are you doing? You know, the Holy Spirit is moving the other direction and you're saying, I've got to go back to Judaism to, you know, to imitate some of those those practices, why? You know, so if that's the motivation, I would say avoid it. Don't get caught up in the that, you know, uh, that, and that's happening in, in, in certain part of Christendom. You do see that happening. I would say, why? Why are you doing it? Because the Bible is telling us to go the other direction. But thank you. Thank you, yeah. Pastor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Um, good. Any other questions that we didn't answer in the end of last uh, class? I, uh, thanks for reminding me. I forgot about those questions. Um, any questions from last week's uh, class on being free in Christ? Um, okay. So we'll move on. Uh, if any questions come, you're always welcome to ask anytime. Okay. So you're with me so far uh, as we start talking about uh, us being children of God and sons and daughters adopted into God's family. And uh, yeah, so we are adopted into God's family. That's, that's what we've covered so far. So let that truth sink into your heart. I am a son. I'm a daughter. I've been adopted into the family of God. The whole spirit of sonship is in me. He is my... He's the one who gives me the conviction that I am a son and daughter of God. And God does not want me to behave like a slave. right? So uh, let me just mention a little bit here. So in one sense, we are servants of God. Paul calls himself a bond servant of God. And we understand we are servants of God. But we are not these fearful, 
uh, we don't behave like fearful slaves of God. So we have the understanding that we are sons and daughters of God. And yet, you know, there are times we, we call ourselves servants of God. What does that mean? That means you're willfully choosing to serve God. But we are not servants of God in the sense of us, you know, being so fearful of God and not having that sense of belonging. No, that's not who we are. We are sons and daughters. We know we belong. God is our heavenly father. And because we are serving him, that's when we refer to ourselves as servants of God or born servants of God, because we're willfully choosing to do what he wants us to do. Okay. So don't get confused by those terms. Now, another aspect of uh, being uh, a child of God is to know that we were chosen. So he chose us, right? And uh, we see this, uh, this um, truth brought out in Romans, the eighth chapter. In Romans 8 and verse 29, it says, for those whom he foreknew, that means he knew beforehand, he chose us beforehand. Right? So I, I, I parallel, he chose us with he foreknew. Right? To foreknew means he knew before time. So the Bible is saying that we've been chosen by God just as he chose us in him, that is in Christ, even before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That means he chose us to be, that we would be before him in love, be loved by him. He chose us that we would be loved by him. Right now, so that's an amazing thought that we've been chosen by God. So the word chosen literally simply means to, you know, God picked us out. You're, you're that special person, right? Uh, and uh, you're the one whom I'm going to put my favor, my love on, and so uh, you, you're, you're chosen by God. So in one sense, you're handpicked. And yet at the, at the same time, while we have this understanding that we are chosen, we also understand that, you know, God gave the invitation to everybody. Right, so because the Bible says many are called, right? So the invitation went out to the whole wide world for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So the gospel is available for everybody. And those who say yes to the gospel, who say yes to Jesus, they become what the Bible refers to as a chosen one, right? So, The invitation is for everybody. Those who say yes to that invitation become chosen ones. That means we become the people God says, look, you're those people I've picked out. But really that picking out was our, our response to his invitation. He invited us and we said yes. So when the scripture says, you know, John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and ordained you. Remember that God's choosing of us was not a partial, arbitrary, indiscriminate thing that he would favor one and not favor the other. That's not God. But God's choosing simply means he extended the invitation to everybody, the whole wide world. And there were some who said yes to that invitation. They became the chosen ones. But God foreknew who those people would be. He knew that you know each one of us here would say yes to that invitation. And we become those chosen ones. Okay, so I'm trying to give uh, both sides to this. It might seem confusing, but uh, we need to understand God's choosing with respect to 
our individual response, our individual yes to his calling, right? So God's choosing is not an indiscriminate, arbitrary, partial call on certain individuals. That's not what it is. But it is an invitation that was given to everybody. And those who said yes, they become whom God calls as the chosen ones. And he knew, foreknew, he knew ahead of time who these people would be. And his plan was that these people who become his chosen ones would be the ones who would have this privilege of experiencing his love. They would be before him in love. But today, you can say, I am a chosen one because you said yes to the gospel and God said, therefore, you are a chosen one. You're chosen to be loved by him. Right? So uh, James chapter 2 verse 5 again kind of brings out this thought that has not God chosen the poor of this world? So when God chooses us, he doesn't choose us based on our you know, our natural standing on earth. He just, the invitations for everybody, whether they are rich or poor, educated, uneducated, um, whatever, whichever part of the world, whichever nationality, he just, everybody's welcome. And even the poor of this world have this wonderful privilege of being chosen ones. And then they become, they become heirs of the kingdom, which we will talk about shortly. Okay. So understand that you are a chosen one of God. And you're chosen to be before him in love. Chosen to be loved. So you can say God zeroed in on me and said, enjoy my love. Enjoy my love being poured out on your life. Now, because we are children, sons and daughters, chosen. God had a plan for these people whom he would call as sons and daughters, whom he would refer to as chosen people. So we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blame without him, before him in love. But he also chose us so that he would predestine us for something. So you find this word predestined. Predestined. Predestined means to plan ahead of time, to plan, to pre-plan. So God planned ahead of time that all his sons and daughters, all who would be his children, all who would be adopted in his family, all who would be these chosen people, whom he foreknew, he predestined that we would be conformed to the image of his son. So what did God predestine us for? That we would be conformed to the image of his son. He predestined us according to the purpose of him. He predestined us for his purpose. He predestined us to adoption. So what did God pre-plan for you and me? He said, I'm pre-planning this for you. You'll be adopted in my family. You will be joining with me in my purpose, according to his purpose. And I'm pre-planning that you will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So God pre-planned this for you and me. So those of us who have said yes to Jesus, we, the call was given to many, but few became the chosen. 
we became the chosen to be loved by God. And God said, I got a plan for you. I'm predestining you to be my son and daughter. I'm predestining you to my purpose. That means you're joining with God in his purposes that, that are being unfolded on the earth. And I'm predestining you to be conformed to the image of my son. That means I'm going to work in you as a son and daughter. I'm going to work in you to carry out my purpose. I'm going to work in you to change you and conform you to become like Jesus. So predestined, you find this word predestined here in both these passages. So we are predestined to adoption, to his purpose, to the image of his son. So to be predestined gives us a sense of eternal destiny. That means God is saying, look, there's, there's this eternal plan that I'm working through you. So as you're here today, or you know, which part of the world you are, there's something that God predestined, which is working in you. That means he planned ahead of time. And that's it. That plan is working through your life. And that plan is ultimately you and I will be conformed to the image of his son. So there is this eternal purpose of God at work in your life. Yes, there is the immediate things that you and I are doing. You know, uh, we have different things, purposes and all of that. But overarching all of that is God saying, my ultimate plan for you is for you to be like Jesus. That means all the smaller plans that are at work in our lives are serving towards this bigger plan to make us like Jesus. So while God does have his purpose working in each of us as individuals. That individual purpose is serving towards this greater purpose of making each of us like Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm gonna pause here. Any questions on this before we go for a break? You all with me so far? Go ahead, Divya, a question, please. Yes, uh, Pastor, thank you. Uh, this is regarding um, the free will of man and how the predestination of God works through it. Uh, so I was just thinking about um, in Exodus when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure whether we can uh, compare uh, the salvation and all the blessings of salvation to this, but uh, just if uh, we take that particular instance, uh, uh, so is it like God is overriding the free will of Pharaoh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, when you look at um, God's dealing with Pharaoh, you see both. You see in the book of Exodus, and I will, I will put this on the chat, I'll just pull it out, um, that the scriptures say, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And I'll give you the scriptures. So Pharaoh hardened his own heart. He chose to say no. So when Moses came, said, let my people go, Pharaoh chose to say no. So he hardened his own heart. Then the scriptures say, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, when the Bible uses this language, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, attributing something like this to God, it has to be understood in the light of the rest of scripture, meaning God, it has to be understood as God, a loving Pharaoh to harden his own heart, not causing Pharaoh 
to become a hard person. For instance, when you go to Romans chapter 1, you read the same similar thing where it says, you know, man, although he knew God, he chose not to give glory to God. But he became foolish in his thinking. And uh, he changed the glory of God into, you know, corruptible things like uh, animals and beasts and all that. And then it says, God gave them up to their own ways of thinking, to their wild passions. So God gave them up to a corrupt and debased mind. So God didn't cause them to become like that. He let them go that way. He gave them up. He let them go. He said, look, if that's what you're choosing, I'll let you go. So when we look back in the Old Testament and we see initially scriptures are saying Pharaoh hardened his heart and then God hardened his heart. It's like, what actually happened? Well, Pharaoh chose to harden his heart. God let him continue that way. And so in that sense, God hardened his heart. Not that God made him that way, but God let him go that way. So Paul addresses this, uh, like we, I think we spoke about it somewhere in Romans chapter 9. You know, he addresses the same thing. Like, uh, does that mean Pharaoh could turn around and say, God, you hardened my heart and you carried out your purpose, which was to get your people out. So why should I be judged? If there was any person who could use that argument, it would be Judas Iscariot. He could turn around to God and say, God, I betrayed Jesus. But if I had not betrayed Jesus, Jesus would not have gone to the cross and the world would not have been saved. So my sin actually brought something good. And God you predestined me to be the sinner for the salvation of the whole world, so I have to be the greater savior. Now, could Judas raise an argument like that? Of course not. Because it was not God, even the God spoke ahead of time about Judas, that Judas would betray Jesus. His speaking ahead of time did not predetermine his action. It was a foretelling of his action. But the choice Judas made was entirely his choice. But God, through it, carried out his purpose. That does not absolve Judas of the fact that he did something wrong. Similarly to Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart. But through that, God fulfilled his purpose. And that does not absolve Pharaoh of the fact that he was responsible for hardening his own heart against God. And he would face the consequences of that. Okay, okay thank you, Pastor. It's very clear. Thank you. Okay, come. Okay, uh, that's a very interesting question. We will take a break now and come back and continue just looking at this whole truth of us being children of God and what God has planned as children for us. Okay. Take a quick break. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 